Welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast, where we explore the spirituality of the Christian child using the method of catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I am your host, Carrie Mecki Lozano. Thank you all for being here again. I'm really excited about this episode. Rebecca Royd Savage is joining me again, and we are going to talk about Sophia Cavaletti, just a glimpse into who she was. Rebecca shares with us some stories about Sophia and what she remembers about the time when she lived with Sophia in Italy for two years. So I'm so excited to share this episode with you. I hope you enjoy. Rebecca, I am so happy that you have joined me on the podcast once again. Thank you, Carrie. It's good to be back. Um, In case anybody has not listened to any of the past episodes that you have been a part of with us, would you please tell us a little bit about who you are and how you got involved in Catechesis of the Good Shepherd? I was a Montessori primary teacher um, in search of a way to do Montessori, but to be able to speak of God, to be able to complete the work cycle with prayer and did not know at that time, this was in um, the mid seventies that there even existed a person named Sophia Cavalletti or anything called the catechesis of the good shepherd. I didn't know what I was really praying for, but I knew that there must be a way. Um, And so I ended up kind of, it would seem accidentally, and it it was not an accident (laughs) in any way, meeting Sophia in a a Montessori conference in Houston, Texas in 1978, and went to her workshop and knew instantly that this was the answer to my prayer. Um, I got Mm -hmm. to go there in 1979, and I got to spend two years doing the course offered at the Rome Atrium um, for for children 3 to 12, and came back to work in an atrium and uh, begin to help form adults. So that was 40 years ago. (laughs) So (laughs) I've been in the atrium for a very long time and have met many wonderful adults through the catechist formation courses across the country. Uh, work part-time for the National Association, and I sit on the board of the International Concilio that seeks to be a sign of unity for the work going on all over the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whenever I hear about um, those of you who are blessed to be able to go live in Italy with Gianna and Sophia and learn about this work, just immerse yourself in this work in that way, I'm I'm just in awe of it. Like how neat that you were able to do that, but also what a jump, like you like close your eyes and jump to go literally live in another country. Where you don't speak the language, you don't have money and (laughs) all of those difficulties, all of those challenges in the end uh, made it even more part of me and more precious Mm -hmm. to me, but Mm -hmm. it was difficult. It was challenging and it was incredibly rewarding so yeah I I find that you know when things are the most difficult though that's when God has the most fertile soil to work on us though so exactly (laughs) I I think it's really neat that you got to do that I would I just I always look forward to hearing all the stories of those kind of times so I'm really excited about this episode a year ago we had Carol Dittburner on the podcast to speak about the life of Maria Montessori and so since then I am just been wanting for this episode. So I'm excited to dive in with you about the life of Sophia Cavaletti. Who was she? What is her story? Like what brought her to this work? So tell us, Rebecca, who was Sophia? Well, first of all, I'm not a biographer. Uh, (laughs) I don't have the sort of, uh, I suppose, discipline that it would take to be an excellent biographer. (laughs) On the other hand, um, a few years before Sophia died, someone had approached her about writing her biography, and she was not um, uh, excited about such a night. <laughs> uh, that was that was who she was. She was not ever um, ambitious about selling herself, about 
uh, achieving world renown. She was truly uh, a servant. And, Mm. you know, I've heard her described a lot as a scholar of scholars. She was um, incredibly uh, gifted intellectually, uh, spiritually, and she was a very hard worker. She was very devoted to her studies. And yet, what she was more than that was quintessential servant because Mm. once she encountered the child once she saw with her own eyes what deep and genuine rapport they have with god and the mystery of god she was laser focused for the rest of her life Uh, the the children and their relationship with god was the centerpiece of her life's work she never abandoned her scholarship, her writing, Mm -hmm. her sitting on the Vatican Council for the Jewish Christian Dialogue, whatever. But it was clear to all of us that the children came first, that their relationship with God was at the very center of her interest. And Mm -hmm. she never abandoned that interest and that love. Yeah, it's almost like the children... Um, highlighted it in a way, like the children made her see something about God that she never discovered that then made her dive even deeper into her studies. Yes. Uh, In preparing to do this interview, I realized that I am not suitable to give a coherent biography of Sophia Cavaletti. I can tell you what my experience with Sophia, what I learned from her, about who she was Mm -hmm. through experience. And then I always rely on people more capable than I of putting it all in her story, her biography in order. Anne Garrido's book, A Year with Sophia Cavaletti, is an excellent resource for anyone who wants to read her story. But um, she was from a very old and noble family in Rome, and she was also the assistant to Eugenio Zoli, former chief rabbi of Rome, who had uh, been baptized as a Catholic uh, during in the early 1940s. She became his assistant um, at the University of Sapienza, where she was a star pupil. She went on to get a doctorate in Uh, languages and the Semitic studies. But she did not have children. She, her, at that point, she had, didn't even have any nieces or nephews. So when she was approached by Adela Costagnocchi, who was a Montessori collaborator and knew Sophia's family, knew that she had this tremendous uh, knowledge and love for the Bible as well as the liturgy, knew that she would have much to offer the child. I always think of it as Adele had to sort of trick Sophia into (laughs) considering it, because in her great humility, she said, but I know nothing about children. Mm -hmm. Um, She would not have presumed to try to wow children with her knowledge, but At any rate, it took only one encounter with a very small group of of six to seven-year-olds who were preparing for First Communion, and they they opened the Bible and just began to read, and she began to lead them in a very rabbinic style of questions, meditative questions, but it was their responses— that were so deep and so genuine. It was the tears that came into one of the boy's eyes when the two hours were over and the moms were there to pick them up, that he did not want to quit. He didn't want to leave. Mm -hmm. And it literally, that's all it took for her to begin a whole new journey, a whole new adventure. She never abandoned, as I said before, her other studies or commitments on committees and so forth, but she began in earnest to pursue this mysterious relationship and and hunger uh, capacity the child has for God. She knew, too, that 
she needed to collaborate with others. She was very aware of her lack of experience with children, her lack of knowledge. In addition to reading everything Maria Montessori ever wrote, she chose uh, a partner, John Nagobi, who was a veteran Montessorian. Um, the two of them remained the closest of friends and collaborators until John's death. Um, and that was in 2001, I believe. Um, but Sophia's heart was so in the, ch the child that even though she was always spending hours and hours a day with her other studies, in many ways, it was clear that what happened in the atrium was a priority. She kept copious journals of what she was learning from the children, what adjustments that she realized she needed to make uh, to serve them more appropriately. So this, again, this journey of true humility, and, and as Montessori had pointed out, that the good teacher was both a scientist and a saint. Sophia was that. She was mm -hmm. very committed to uh, true observation and learning from the child, uh, but she also had this profound respect for the child's own relationship with God. Mm. Yeah, it was like in that moment with those five children that she saw that verse of, unless you can become like children, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. It's like she saw that very right. tangibly in that moment. And she was right. like, it, there was this like huge aha for her that just kind of became a um, fork in her life because then she was so committed to this. Right. I always like to think too, and anytime I've ever spoken about Sophia, I've almost always included this, that I think the normal path uh, for someone as intelligent and well-educated as Sophia would have been to come upon an idea for a thesis, for a dissertation, and then to do in a very uh, planned, uh, structured way to do what they needed to do in order to publish, in order to... Right, with that being your end goal. Professor, whatever. But with Sophia, it was always a response to a direct encounter. It was that way with those small group of children we, we just spoke about. It was mm -hmm. just the actual being together, listening to them, that very direct encounter. It was the same in terms of she, which Anne Greta refers to, and it's also in one of our past journals, her story of during the war times, uh, offering her services as a catechist of sorts to an older young woman, Irma, um, and all of the tools that Sophia had at that point were the catechism, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah. she talks about um, how she, with trying to work with Irma with the catechism, nothing clicked, nothing moved Irma, nothing stuck. <laughs> and until she just brought the gospel with her and just began to read and ponder together. That mm -hmm. was what she attributes as her conversion from catechism to the catechesis. Right. That it was through one woman, one refugee, one moment that, that, that she was able. And when I hear those sorts of things, I always think the Lord prepares us for the work that the Lord wants from us. Right. And right. so someone else might have worked with Irma and attributed her lack of engagement to many other factors. But Sophia was prepared to recognize um, there's got to be a different way. There's something right. wrong in the methodology. So, but the same thing happened with. Uh, her moving into the work with adolescents, uh, she originally thought Tilde Cucchini was the level two catechist in Rome, and she had two daughters. Uh, they were young teens at the time. I'm, again, terrible at specific 
dates, but I think they were both more in the range of 11 and 12 years old. So Sophia's first thought, wanting to help Tilde's children, she thought, well, she'd just train them as catechists of the little ones. But in being with them, in meeting them, what did she saw was that they too are hungry for needing to encounter a particular face of God. And mm-hmm. so what is that? But again, what was her motivation? Her motivation sprung from being in the presence of two young teens. Um, and that's critical in our world today, that we are uh, open to the movement of the Holy Spirit in an actual child, an actual family, an actual parish situation, rather than put all our energy on this perfect method and then try to just put it wherever we want to put it. Right, right. It's neat to read, though, about the different people who influence Sophia, because you can see like that golden thread into straight into our work, like you mentioned Zoli and how he taught her that rabbinical method of sitting with scripture and just pondering it and all its many meanings. And like, I think about the story you just told about Irma, that formulaism had be, has become, had become and has become such a, I don't know, popular or a common way of passing on our faith. So that's kind of what she attempted with Irma at first with the catechism. But then she realized through that experience and then solidified with her experience with Zoli and learning the rabbinical method that sitting with the scripture, pondering it together, just kind of letting it percolate in your heart and see what God is telling you, all the multiple meanings it could have. Yes like that golden thread that God had in her life and then how it influenced this work. It's just, I love that. I love seeing those connections. Um, Which for me, that's, that's why I like Ann Garrido's book so much is that she goes through the year with Sophia Cavaletti's writings, the people who most influenced the spiritual people, the theologians, who had most influenced her, but it comes to another, and it's really connected to, I think, perhaps the most important virtue of Sophia Cavaletti was true humility. Mm -hmm. Um, With all her incredible education and background and uh, title, Mm -hmm. in fact, when I got to Rome, I, uh, or in the early weeks that I was there, Sophia invited me to that big midday meal, uh, early afternoon meal, pranzo. And before I went in for the meal, I had been looking at a particular bookshelf in the atrium, and I found a book that referred to her as Marquesa Sophia Cavaletti. And I, I who am, had no... <laughs> rubbing shoulders with nobility didn't wasn't even sure that that was a, a title of nobility so during lunch to let you know how unintimidated i was in awe of sophia but i was not intimidated by her but during lunch i said at one point sophia i read you referred to as marquesa is that a title And she got this very sheepish kind of Mona Lisa smile, sort of, you know, mischievous sort of smile. And she said, oh, yes, Rebecca, and it means I'm very important. (laughs) But, you know, in spite of her family wealth and nobility, in spite of all her education and writings and achievements, she truly was completely detached from all those things. Mm -hmm. Uh, She was so in love with uh, learning the child, the child's relationship with God. um, And it it was just one of her most outstanding virtues, a true Mm -hmm. virtue, right? Uh, I always think about the very fact that she had the children call her Sophia, (laughs) 
mm-hmm. not Dottoressa Cavalletti or Marchesa or, but Sophia. Um, I think most all catechists, one of my other favorite examples of that humility was she actually, they actually had in Rome, in the Rome atrium, a closet of humility, we called it, <laughs> uh, where they had spent so much time and energy making material, a material, but they had put it before the children. And over time, they saw that it did not engage the children in meaningful work. And so they came to a point when they said, no, this is not a good material for the atrium. Even when they mm-hmm. had spent all that time, and I think, how many of us catechists who've made a material and spent a lot of time and effort would be willing to do that? But So they would just mm-hmm. archive it, put it in their closet where they were learning things. Sophia was no more an artisan than I am a high-tech person, but <laughs> she learned to work with, she didn't have any power tools, at least not that I remember. She had a little coping saw, uh, but Sophia taught herself carpentry just so she could make materials for the children. Um, that that level of humility, of uh, genuine love for the work that needed to be done, and collaboration, realizing the importance of true collaboration, that this is not a one woman show. It's mm-hmm. in fact, one of the things that always upset Sophia most was when anyone re- would refer to her in terms of responsibility for the catechesis without also at the same, within the same breath, naming Johnna. Mm. Uh, she truly did not want to be a superstar, which you know, is very rare in our culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I certainly was a beneficiary of that desire for true collaboration. Um, when I translated uh, what was then called History's Golden Thread, the first uh, English translation of it, I, who in no way felt a competent translator, but she made that decision. She wanted me to do it. It took me 10 years. (laughs) But in the end, she genuinely thanked me um, because she, she really was open to the gifts that other people brought to the work and that saw that that's how our work grows Mm. is that over time, we all have something to contribute to it. And it uh, that's what makes it a living and active. And then there was the other factor for me that's so outstanding, having been trained as a Montessorian. Um, my experience had been both in my training and even more so in uh, big gatherings of Montessori organizations. There was a sense for me of the adults only hope for to be worthy and valuable in society was to serve the child. You know, the child was everything. And mm-hmm. the adults are just too flawed and past <laughs> time, you know. But when I got to Rome, I just relished, ate up this feeling that I was as or more respected and appreciated and worthy um, as those beautiful children are. (laughs) Mm -hmm. This was Mm -hmm. a a unique thing. Um, Sophia, again, her humility that from the time I met her, it took me a full year to get there. And during that time, she never quit writing to me to encourage me, helping me find a family I could live with because she understood I didn't have money, um, mm-hmm. helping me in every way. She even picked me up at the airport um, and didn't send her driver to get me. <laughs> she mm-hmm. picked me up. Uh, Nora... Bonilla and Maria Chrisley were there. Uh, We were the three international students at that time, but she did that for each of us. 
Um, in the mornings, we would work in the atriums. No one else was there. We would do our album work, and I would listen to the tapes of her uh, her Monday evening three-hour lectures and try to figure out what she had said. But she would always, if she was available at all, she would always come in and sit with each one of us at some point to see where we were, to see uh, what we might need. Uh, this That's that going way beyond what a director of a course. Mm, right. Those Monday evening uh, talks that she would give, those three-hour talks that you were just referring to, are those what ended up turning into ways to nurture the relationship with God and drinking from the sources? Is yes. that what you're referring to? Yes. Oh, that's so, so neat. So Patricia Coulter had gone, uh, she had finished her course in Rome that year before I went. So I think okay. she finished in 1978 and I arrived in 1979. But Patricia had taken those course notes and uh, turned them into a book. But yes, right. Sophia spoke for three hours, and wow. it was a fairly large group. We were stuffed into the, on the little atrium chairs we brought into the chapel area, um, and people came from the different pontifical universities for those classes. Um, only the three of us were there as full-time students. Others, mm. though, came to listen to her on Monday evening. So it was a much larger community of people who were interested in her work and wanted to get whatever ideas they could. Mm. And this was at her home or was yes, that Yes, everything was at her home. She had... Wow. She and um, her helper, Augusta, uh, had a wing. Um, and then the atrium... Uh, there were the three rooms that were the level one, level two, and level three atria. And then the the chapel area, it, when you first enter it, you would think it's just a very large foyer. But there were these beautiful um, built-in screens over to the right as you came in the room. And when you folded them back, there was a beautiful altar there. Mm. So we did use the room for other things, but it was also where we had the regular uh, atrium masses. You had masses with the children when they would come? Approximately once a month, Father Giancarlo came, um, a Jesuit priest who loved the atrium, loved the children, and the children would prepare the readings, make the procession. We would have uh, a mass together, and then the little ones would go back to their atrium to continue with their work, and the level two and three children would stay for this period of mystagogy, when rather than rush away from this beautiful um, moment we've had, uh, receiving him, being in his presence, then it was very important to her that we never rush away from important events. So the children would sit around and they would, you know, she or one of the other catechists would lead the questions, but what's particularly struck you in the Mass today? And it might be something as basic as when the priest washed his hands. Mm -hmm. And that would lead them in some way to want, why does he do that? Where do we know about that from the Bible? It would be, again, um, unstructured, but mm -hmm. it, it covered those basic elements of mystagogy. And the children, therefore, would not just uh, at the end of Mass, you know, go in peace and get up and rush off to something else. There was always right. that lingering, which was, I had never experienced that anywhere. Right, right. So did she have the group of kids that came, because she had all three levels at the same time. Yes, yes. And they came just once a week? Once a week. Uh, during my time there, it was a Wednesday from 4 to 6 p.m. It was all three levels. And no other time during the week. That was just once a week. Uh, it was very comforting to me because I am not someone who can do, could do an atrium every day. Right. And that was one of the most 
important ways Sophia helped me personally was to say, you don't have to be a full-time catechist. Some people are, but you do not have to be a full-time catechist. What matters is that the time you were in the atrium is an overflow, Mm -hmm. an offshoot of joy from your prayer life, your regular life. So I felt completely uh, blessed to say I don't yeah. have to be that high energy person that can do five or six different groups every week. Right, right. I, I, I have this image in my head right now as you're talking about Jesus going off to pray by himself <laughs> and how healthy and okay that that is. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and how beautiful that Sophia is like, I one day a week for two right. hours. Right. That is what it we was offer. her limit. That was what she could do, and she did it with her whole heart. But um, it, it was wonderful to find that freedom to be true to oneself. And then coming back and having young children, there's no way I could have done more than one atrium a week. Right, right. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And she predominantly would be in the level three part. Because is it correct that all three atrium kind of flowed into each other? They weren't three separate rooms? They were three separate rooms. They were, uh, there were only, um, you know, the French type doors between Mm -hmm. each one, but they were their own room. But Um, the children kind of flowed a little bit? A little bit. The only real floating I saw was. Level two children, there was only one large race surface map at the land of Israel that Sophia had made. It was spectacular. Mm-hmm. It, usually it, it lived in the level one atrium, but level two children, even though they had the pin maps, would often go back into the level one atrium just to work with that race surface map because Sophia had, even on that one that was in level one, Sophia had added the many other cities that were significant in Jesus's life. So the, mm. uh, they loved, the level two children loved to go in there. I'm trying to think generally the level threes kept to themselves. They were mm. the ones least likely to, uh, visit another space unless there was a particular reason. Yeah, yeah, that kind of seems to mimic that age child. Yeah. But that's also where she predominantly oh, was, yes. was, that was, that age child level three. That was where Jonna was always uh, uh, more at home in, or I always associate Jonna more with the primary, the, the le- three to six-year-olds. Uh, Sophia was definitely... Uh, almost always in the level three atrium. That was her home uh, with those that age children. And then Tilde was in level two? Tilde, yes. Francesca and Patrizia's mother was in the level two. Mm. And again, she she just had a particular gift for that age. And that too was lovely, that we as catechists, uh, are invited to get in touch with their own, um, I don't know, leanings, preferences, where we feel yeah. happiest. I've done all three levels, um, and I've, I've loved them all, but I would have to say my my personality, I am most myself, I feel like, in level one with the mm. ones, yeah. But mm. we, you know. We do where we go where we're most needed, but Sophia was, you know, inviting us to consider that to be aware of there are is a particular gift we might receive in a certain atrium that yeah. nourishes us in in a unique way. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I imagine if she only offered this once a week, were there a bunch of children that were just waiting to or like parents that were wanting to sign their kids up to be a no, part of it? or I don't really know about that. What The only thing I know about the participants' clientele, if you will, of the atrium was that many of them were people who knew about Sophia, knew of her family. It was a sort of, um, you know, they were f- familiar people from... Sophia's circle. Others came. John Gobi's niece came there. I mean, there were other people, but I never had the sense 
that there was a waiting list. Maybe mm-hmm. there was that I never knew about, but, uh, and the, the atrium numbers were not large. Um, there were, when the two years I was there, I would say there was an average of maybe eight to 10 children in each of the atriums. Mm-hmm. I never remember an atrium with 25 children in it. Right, they, right. they tended to be smaller, 10, 12 children. Was the work accepted in Italy the same way that we see it in other parts of the world? Um, I would have to say uh, that the example I would give to that is that it took them 50 years from the time they first began in 1954 to uh, 2004 to offer a citywide, churchwide, all the dioceses and churches were invited to a, a gathering, an open house, if you will. It was not held at Sophia's. It was held at the um, Santa Maria Maggiore, the diocesan seat church. Uh, there was a Jesuit seminary there, and they gave us rooms to set up the three atria and uh, invitations were sent out to the whole, uh, all the churches in the diocese to come. Um, but I think my sense that, first of all, that that Rome, at least, was a, only a very small percentage of people living in Rome um, came to church, went were active in the church at mm-hmm. all. And of those, my sense was the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd is an extremely rare um, approach for Italy. Mm -hmm. In fact, we had far more, when we brought it back to the States, it grew far more rapidly than it ever did. It's only now, I think right now, it seems to be having a bit of a resurgence or growth in the church uh, uh, becoming more known, Francesca has been invited to do more um, podcasts and uh, offerings, conferences for people within the diocese. But in Italy, in Italy, that's yeah. part of what we accept. It's um, it's still not a mainstream right uh, offering. The Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. Yeah, it's a mustard seed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Do you know anything about the picture of Pope John Paul II in the atrium with Sophia? Well, I can tell you that it was not at the Via degli Orsini, uh, you know, mother house, where they had also had an atrium. And Pope John Paul II visited, you know, during the uh, visits of the bishop type thing. Uh, that that particular setting was chosen for him to visit. So he happened to be in a to visit a parish. It wasn't, as my understanding, it wasn't because he specifically wanted to see it, uh, wanted to see a catechesis of the Good Shepherd Atrium. But um, you know, it was announced that he was going to be coming, and it was from all of Sophia's until they stories. He was genuinely amazed at what mm. of the children and their answers to him when he had a, a conversation with them, but it was not at Via del Orsini. Mm, her home, yeah. So one other thing before we finish, Rebecca, would you speak about, like, what did Sophia do when she wasn't reading or with the children? Well, she loved antiquity. She would take... Uh, All of, well, Nora, Maria, and I individually, she liked to take us one at a time, and she would take us to these obscure holy sites around Rome or the outskirts of Rome. Uh, She loved history. She loved uh, Italian history, Rome, especially the history of the church. Um, You know, she was a very private person in a way that. I knew her in the context of the atrium. Uh, she loved to have dinners for us, and uh, Augusta was an amazing cook. Mm-hmm. But she, her other friends, I remember one year at Christmas time, Bafana, they celebrate 
you know, for the at the Epiphany, the Bafana, the old lady that the three three wise men stopped at her house looking for the Christ child. She was uh, obsessed with her house chores and somewhat grumpy, and she didn't know, couldn't tell them where he was. She hadn't heard of him. So they go on their way, and then she starts thinking about him and thinking about what they had said. So she bakes up a bunch of cookies and cakes and things to go and take to this special child that's been born. And, uh, you know, the legend is that uh, she's still searching. You know, when she's searching, she's the one who leaves goodies and treats um for the children in their stockings so that mm-hmm. celebrate epiphany well i remember one year um sophia had a bifana party for us and a stocking and everything and one of the mm-hmm. people one of the people at that bifana celebration was eleonora morrow whose husband aldo morrow Um, He had worked for the government. He was brutally kidnapped and brutally murdered um, by the Red Guard. And Mm. Eleonora was a catechist. And I remember one of the kindest, sweetest, I thought she she reminded me of sort of a good witch. She was, there was something wonderfully um, childlike about her. Uh, even though she had been through such awful things. And I realized then, and answer you to a question about Sophia's life beyond the atrium, I realized too that she would have very close friends and that she had a private life. Uh, that always comforts me when I, someone like Sophia, that to know that there's variety in her life. She doesn't just study. She doesn't just do the work of the catechesis. Mm-hmm. She has these wonderful relationships. Uh, as you know, uh, Father, she had with Father Mangilo. Uh, he was truly a friend, and she always looked forward to his coming to town when he retired to Bari uh, after he had heart issues. Um, and whenever he came in town, she was excited he would come by and they would have, you know, their visit together. So she had a life beyond the atrium, beyond mm-hmm. her books, but it was quite, um, it was quite private. And, and I don't know, really, mm. I don't know. I know years ago, someone did an interview of her and she said in that interview, uh, at one point, the children have saved me. And the interviewer said, what do you mean the children have saved you? Saved you from what? And she had said, from being a mouse in the library. Mm-hmm. So she did have a life beyond the library. But mm. I I don't know. But that's beautiful. That, that yeah. The privacy of it is also, like you said... There's a safety and beauty to that that gives right. us all permission to have that as well. Right. Hmm. So one last thing. Augusta uh, told us after Sophia had died that in those last weeks uh, before she died, she would ask Augusta every day or most every day to wheel her in her wheelchair into the atrium and leave her there. Um, The children weren't there anymore. They had already moved the atrium to Francesca's home, but she just wanted to be in that space and remember um, those children. Mm -hmm. Um, That's the image I carry of her most, is Mm -hmm. she did something she was deeply called to do. She did it to the end. And it was what she treasured most as well. She was called by name and she followed. That's right. How beautiful. Rebecca, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing um, a little bit about your relationship with Sophia and giving us a glimpse into who she was. Such a gift. Thank you, Carrie.
Thank you all for listening to this week's episode of the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. I have a few different links in our show notes for some of the books and journals that we spoke about. So the biggest one is A Year with Sophia Cavaletti, which is by Anne Garrido. And in this book, this is a really neat book, guys. So in this book, Anne dives into the different influencers the theological and spiritual influencers of our work of the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, starting with Sophie Cavaletti and her bio and Gianna and Maria Montessori. But then also we talked about Zoli and Heschel and Chardin, a lot of really amazing people. And we're going to be referring to this book a few times in in this next year. So go ahead and grab your copy if you don't yet have a year with Sophia Cavaletti. Again, it's a really neat book. I also have a link for our commemorative journal of Sophia Cavaletti that we put out. And it has a lot of select writings by Sophia, a short bio by Karen Maxwell about Sophia. And also at the end, it has stories from Francesca Cuccini about when she was in Sophia's atrium. So it's a really neat journal. So if you don't have your hands on that one, Go ahead and grab a copy of that as well. And I went ahead and put a link for Way of Holy Joy, which is selected writings of Sophia that Patricia Coulter put together for us. And so it's, it, this is a really neat book as well. I'm a big fan of this book. So I put links to those three. I also put links to other episodes that Rebecca has been with us on the podcast in case you want to hear more from Rebecca. Now, for the really exciting news. Some of you may have already heard um, our members got an email earlier this week, but we are now able to provide an audio version of the Religious Potential of the Child, the third edition. And Rebecca actually is the one who reads the book. So that's a really neat connection between this episode and this new launch that we're very excited to provide for you guys. Now, the audiobook is provided through Podbean, which is the platform that I use for the podcast. Now, the podcast is going to remain free for everyone. But if you would like access to the premium podcast channel that contains all the chapters of the audiobook of the Religious Potential of the Child 3rd Edition, there is a cost of $29 to access that premium podcast channel. I have instructions, both video and written instructions, on our website to help step-by-step you in the process. But I wanted to quickly go through how you can access the audio book. So you do need to have the Podbean app. So you do have to have a mobile device such as a iPhone or an Android phone, or I think even like an iPad, you could download the Podbean app via your app store or your Google Play app store. You then need to have a log in for Podbeam. And then once you have a login, you just search for the religious potential of the child and you will the channel will come up and you will be able to click it. And at the bottom, you will be able to, it says like buy now. When you click that, it'll, it'll allow you to purchase what Podbeam calls golden beans. And this is when you will need to purchase golden beans, enough golden beans to purchase access to the premium channel. And then once you've purchased the golden beans, you can purchase the premium channel, and then you can listen to the religious potential of the child as you're going for walks or in your car. I'm really excited about this. I'm going to be using this all the time. If you have any questions, please go to the link in our show notes because we have on our website, again, video and written instructions on how to access this premium channel that contains the audiobook. I also created a premium channel that has all the talks from the 2014 international conference that we had, the new child, the new adult. There's a lot of really great talks. And so I'm excited to be able to provide this as well. You can access this. We have a USB from in our store where you can access all the talks. You've been able to access the talks that way. I just felt that it would be really easy if it was also available in this format as well. So if you want access to those talks, that's a different premium channel that you can purchase golden beans to be able to purchase access to this premium channel as well. So again, 
There's a bunch of notes on our website in order to help you through this if you have any questions. This podcast is sponsored by the United States Association of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. If you would like to know more about Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, or if you would like to become a member, please go to cgsusa.org. Thank you all for listening this week. We will see you in two weeks. Go and fall more deeply in love with God.